Welcome, dear friends. Welcome to our spiritual home, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tarpon Springs. We are glad to have you with us today. My name is Judy Lucarelli, and I serve on the Board of Trustees. I use she, her pronouns to describe myself, and I'm a white woman. In April, I'll be 74. For those of you who cannot see clearly, I have gray and brown hair long enough to braid. I meant to braid it on the ride today, and then I got thrown off when the battery was dead, and I braided with Greg instead. So, but we're here. Thank you, Greg. I can, I'll just tip it like that. <laughs> it, it doesn't, this one doesn't like to adjust. Okay. If I did that on my own, it would fall off. <laughs> Take some of the special technical skills, I guess. Um, since the age of 12, I have been five foot, 10 inches tall. I have hazel eyes, wear wire rimmed glasses and dangling earrings. While I hail from the Passamaquoddy lands of the Wabanaki, we want to acknowledge that here at this church, we are on the lands of the Tokabaga and Seminole peoples. We are a church of many welcomes, and we offer a warm welcome to all of you. This is a liberal community for all ages, promoting spiritual growth, social justice, and the arts. As such, ours is an active church, and everyone is invited to participate in any of our activities. To learn more about events, our church calendar is on our website, uutarpin.org, or we'd be happy to talk with you during coffee hour. Our children are with us during the beginning of the service. We have faith formation programming available with our gifted leaders, Jamie and Anna. Children gather for their time together with them after the story. If you'd like more information about our programming or to help out, uh, please contact Reverend Christina after the service. For those present with us in the building, we have connection cards available in the pews near the hymnals. If you fill one out front and back and put it in the offering plate or give it to one of the greeters, we'll be able to keep in touch with you. If you're watching on Zoom or YouTube, you can send us an email at membership at uutarpin.org to get connected. There are also small cards in the pews to write any joys or sorrows that you would like to share with us if you'd like me to read your joy or sorrow instead of coming forward to share it yourself at the end of the service. Our service today is led by our very own Reverend Christina Spouty. Music is provided by music director Bonnie Whitehurst and our inimitable choir. <laughs> Again, welcome. Our opening hymn is uh, number 1063 in the Teal Hymn Book, 1063. I'll play it through once and then we'll sing all four verses. Okay. Oh, 
I have discovered since moving to Florida that it is a challenge to find appropriate hymns to sing here that don't involve lots of snow and other kinds of experiences that we don't have here. So that was a new one for me and I'm grateful for it. I am the Reverend Christina Spouty. I use she, her pronouns and am a white woman. I am tall with shoulder length curly brown hair parted on one side with blue eyes. Our opening words this morning come from Gretchen Haley. This is the longing for something more. Every little thing that breaks your heart is welcome here. We'll make a space for it, give it its due time and praise for the wanting it represents, for the longing for something more some healing hope that remains not yet we promise no magic no making it all better but offer only this circle of trust this human community that remembers though imperfectly that sings and prays sometimes awkwardly this gathering that loves, though not yet enough. We're still practicing, after all. Still learning, still in need of help and partners. Still becoming able to receive all this beauty and all these gifts we each bring. Come, let us worship together. Alex. We light our chalice with these words from Sharon Wiley. In honor of ancient traditions that celebrate this time of longest night, we observe that the flaming chalice holds the elements of the four directions, earth, air, fire, water, the lamp oil for earth, the air that feeds the flame, the fire we light. And we had lots of water. And let us sing number one, two, three in the gray hymnal, Spirit of Life. Our story this morning is titled Winter's Gifts, an Indigenous Celebration of Nature, written by Caitlin Curtis and illustrated by Gloria Felix. This book has been gifted to us from Mark Hopkins. 
Caitlin Curtis is an author that we have referenced multiple times over the course of this year. She is an indigenous author, a member of the Potawatomi Nation, and so this book is a reflection of her experiences and beliefs about being in relationship with nature. As such, it includes a number of Potawatomi words, which I looked up and was lucky to find that the Potawatomi Cultural Heritage Center exists and has an online dictionary for English and Potawatomi so that you can learn how to pronounce words correctly in the indigenous language. Well, I was excited about it, of course, <laughs> as the linguist. Our story begins. Donnie touches a frost-covered branch on the oak tree in her yard. She shivers. Winter, or Babon, is coming in a few days. Her family will light a fire, or shkode, and think about the darkest night of the year. Many of her friends are afraid of the dark, but not Donnie. The dark feels like a hug, and winter is a time for cozy hugs. The dark of winter reminds us to rest. Even the bears rest in winter. Inside, the wood stove glows. Donnie cuddles up next to her brother, Bo, and their dog, Sam. She thinks about hugs and good dogs and what it means to wait. The next day, there is more snow on the ground. After school, Donnie comes home and makes snowballs to throw at her brother. By dinner time, it is already dark. How long does the darkness last? Donnie asks her parents. Her dad answers. The dark will be here for a while, but when the sun's birthday, the winter solstice, comes, the days slowly get longer again. That is one of winter's gifts. Donnie thinks about the gifts of winter. They are different from the gifts that come during the holidays. Winter's gifts are telling stories and waiting. Another gift of winter is resting like the bears. After we rest for a while, the sun brings back the grass, flowers, and the leaves on the trees. Donnie remembers that the Creator made the sun, or Gizus, to be our grandfather, and the moon, or Debuk Gizus, to be our grandmother. They work together like partners to help us understand Earth and the seasons. Donnie knows that the earth is very special. Creator gave her to us to be our mother and to provide us with the things we need to live. On the first day of winter, Donnie wakes up excited. At school, Donnie and her classmates study the moon's phases. Donnie loves Grandmother Moon and is grateful for Creator's gifts of darkness and light. That evening, Donnie and her family light candles to honor the beginning of winter, the sun's birthday. They eat lots of food and talk about why they love Mother Earth, or Segamawakwe, and Creator so much. They also talk about their ancestors who celebrated the changing seasons. The next day at school, Donnie tells her friends about her winter celebration. They laugh and say that it's strange to celebrate the earth. Donnie tells them about the gifts of rest and waiting. They say, earth doesn't give us gifts. Donnie walks away, confused. At home, Donnie sits beneath her favorite oak tree, where she built a fort. She talks to the trees and touches the snow. She thanks them for their gifts and hopes that one day her friends will understand. That night, Donnie tells her parents how sad she is that her friends don't believe in Mother Earth's gifts. Her mom says, Sometimes we forget we are all friends with the Earth and every living creature. The winter teaches us to rest, to remember, and to be thankful. Your thankfulness is your gift to Mother Earth, Donnie. 
That night, she dreams she is gathered with her friends in a big circle around a giant tree, linking arms and singing. As they sing, the animals come to join them. They sing to Grandfather Sun until he sets, and they sing to Grandmother Moon as she dances into the sky. The next morning, Donnie thanks Creator for the dream, whispering, Miigwech, Mama Gosnun. She gets dressed and runs outside to her favorite oak tree. Leaves dance in the wind and snow falls off the branches onto her hand. Donnie laughs. Her friends from school come and ask if she'd like to go sledding with them. Afterward, they come back to Donnie's house for hot cocoa. Donnie can't decide if she should show them her tree. Will they laugh? Then she remembers what her parents told her. She is proud to be friends with Mother Earth. Would you like to see my favorite tree? She asks them. Her friends follow her outside. How did you build this fort? They ask. This tree is amazing, they say. Donnie wonders if she should tell them about her dream. She is nervous, but she remembers what it felt like to sing with all of her friends and the animals. She takes a deep breath. A few of her friends giggle and say they need to go home. But two of her friends ask to hear the song from the dream. Donnie closes her eyes and begins to sing. As she finishes the song, it begins to snow. They all run back inside for another cup of cocoa. Tell us about winter's gifts, Donnie's friends say. Donnie tells them about waiting for spring, about grandfather sun and grandmother moon, and about rest. Her friends smile. Donnie smiles too. We will sing the children and youth to their programming with an extra special surprise from Jamie this morning. And as we do so, we will sing hymn number 413 in the gray hymnal, Go Now in Peace. And as we do, I will light this candle to celebrate our community. <laughs> time in the service where we take our offering for the work and welfare of this church. This month, the Social Justice Council is asking for donations for the Martin Luther King Scholarship Fund. For those at church here today, there are plain envelopes in the pews to use to donate cash, and you can write your name on the envelope if you'd like. For those at home, please go to our website, uutarpin.org, click the Donate button, and select Social justice, give the plate. The offering will now be given and received. Our offertory music is in your teal hymnal, uh, number 1043. It's in two parts. Um, we won't make you sing the Transylvanian language. We are going to use ah, and we'll sing part one, um, just humming openly, and then we will sing part two, together and then we will sing both parts at once and at that time you can select which part that you want to sing.
some words of reflection that perhaps you would like to meditate on during our moment of silence. These words come from my colleague, Carrie Kopnick. This is Blue Christmas. This too belongs. The sound of rain, not cheerful songs. A quiet rocking chair, not traditions of the season. The early sunset, not dancing lights. Loss, tender heart, hollow soul, empty days. Grief is welcome, a sacred part of the mourning, of the bereft, of the weeping. Amidst the celebrating, this too belongs. This too is holy. It binds us to our ancestors, the earth, the stars, yet still, a steaming mug of tea warms the belly. The dog wags its tail and the cat purrs. There are laughter and tears, sometimes both beside the joy. This too belongs. Sharing human suffering is connection. Hearts like stones are held by all that is. Grief and light intertwined. This, too, belongs. So now we will hold a moment of silence to let you settle into yourselves and your seats. Might take some deep breaths deep into your belly if that's comfortable for you. Our reading this morning comes from Rebecca Parker. This is Winter Solstice. Perhaps for a moment the typewriters will stop clicking, the wheels stop rolling, the computers desist from computing, and a hush will fall over the city. For an instant in the stillness, the chiming of the celestial spheres will be heard as earth hangs poised in the crystalline darkness and then gracefully tilts. Let there be a season when holiness is heard and the splendor of living is revealed. Stunned to stillness by beauty, we remember who we are and why we are here. There are inexplicable mysteries. We are not alone. In the universe, there moves a wild one whose gestures alter Earth's access toward love. In the immense darkness, everything spins with joy. The cosmos enfolds us. We are caught in a web of stars, cradled in a swaying embrace, rocked by the holy night, babes of the universe. Let this be a time we wake to life like spring wakes in this moment of winter solstice.
as a child, usually when the weather was cold and the light was less, I would sometimes make these blanket nests on the floor in my room. This mostly happened only during times of distress or when I feel like I needed to be surrounded by great comfort. I would grab up all my blankets and comforters and make a kind of pile with them and burrow inside. After the first time, I quickly learned that I'd get too hot, and so to make a little small hole out of one side where my head was to keep the air flowing and allow some cooler air to enter. Often then, I would sleep or just snuggle into the warmth and disconnection from the rest of the world. It's been a long time since the last time that I did this, and I'm sure that my back appreciates that. But the instinct to hide away from the world, snuggled in safe and comfy in a space, is one that I still have, especially in the winter when the light is less. Maybe like me, you've just been feeling a deep need to rest, to nap, to sleep more than usual, or just to disconnect from the outside world. As we approach the longest night of the year, the winter solstice, I expect at least some of us might be feeling such a longing, even amidst all the holiday things going on, or maybe because of all these holiday things going on. Sometimes we just need to rest. Our bodies, our hearts, our minds, our spirits, or maybe all of them. Our broken hearts bring a lethargy that cannot be glossed over. As war continues to devastate the world and the climate crisis worsens, as our political climate remains hostile, for those of us who are sensitive to distractions, overwhelmed by the news and social media, affected by the lessening of the light, it helps to take some time and let go, set the chaos aside, forget the tragedy in the world for just a moment or for as long as you need. I promise it will still all be there when you're ready to engage with it again. And then just breathe. I'm not sure when I first started appreciating the enveloping comfort of the nighttime. I worked second shift for years, having worked in retail through high school, college, grad school, college, and grad school again. I didn't always care for it much then, although the evenings and night times had their own rhythm to appreciate. Before my hypothyroidism started, I would come home from work at midnight and would go running for an hour before bed. As someone raised and encultured as female, I was more than aware of the risks that could come with this, and so I did my best to take care. There's a quiet and a peace in the world in the nighttime that tugged at me to be present, though, when most people sleep, even in that college town, even living just down the street from the university. Maybe some of it is the miracle of it all, how small we are in the scope of the universe, despite our attempts to make it not seem so. The way everything that doesn't matter so much shrinks in size in comparison, the scale of meaning shifts to a simpler value. Van Gogh wrote, for my part, I know nothing with any certainty, but the sight of the stars makes me dream. Even without the stars, which are hard to see from our crowded living places, being awake in a world during slumber, when the distractions are few and it feels like it's mostly you and the vastness of it all, is grounding and freeing in ways that are hard to express. I titled this service after Van Gogh's masterpiece, The Starry Night, one of my favorite pieces of art, so much so that I finished cross-stitching it recently with more than 10 months 
put into it. While the winter times are full of beauty, they are also full of challenge for many of us. Those who have seasonal affective disorder, depression, or other mental illnesses, and those of us who have experienced loss, are sensitive to the world, or just having a rough time. Van Gogh was one of these, and his episode that happened in late December, actually, of 1888, that led to the self-mutilation of his left ear, and eventually got him to admit himself for care and support in May of 1889. The Starry Night was painted the following month, reminding Van Gogh, and perhaps us as well, that darkness, difficulty, beauty, and wonder can all exist at the same time. Hope is in the stars, he wrote. He remained in the mental institution for a year. Mental institution or asylum is not really an appropriate translation for where he was. Saint-Paul de Mausolée had been a monastery before becoming an institution, and it catered to the wealthy. It has been described as a spa, but I would say it was more like a retreat center, which is a more accurate depiction of the place for France in that era. When Van Gogh was there, fewer than half the rooms were occupied, and so he had his own studio space separate from his room. Treatment there undoubtedly included abundant time for rest and creativity, and he used them to heal. Van Gogh produced 143 oil paintings and more than 100 drawings during his stay there. Rest and retreat are good for us in ways that our capitalist society doesn't allow us to know. The amount of activities that happen in December are mostly for celebration, as a way to gather with loved ones and give thanks, but they also often serve as a way to fend off the darkness and the inward journeying that accompanies it this time of year. We keep busy, we keep distracted sometimes as a way to avoid being confronted with ourselves. Our ancestors would gather in the dark and sit by a fire, whether sharing stories or staring mindlessly at the ways the flames jump and dance. They were doing more inner work than we might experience at a holiday party with hors d'oeuvres, bustling about, hopping from place to place, or watching TV. To be clear, these are all wonderful uses of time. They just have different purposes. Winters historically have been a time for social, especially family, bonding. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the ways the word dark and darkness have been used to oppress, marginalize, and terrorize black, indigenous, and other people of color, people of the global majority in the US and other Euro-American nations and in colonialism. The equation of dark and darkness with evil deepened racism and was used to justify slavery and continues as a part of the narrative that slaughters our black and brown siblings and neighbors today. It is in part for this reason that I was recently drawn to a book by author Catherine May titled Wintering, the power of rest and retreat in difficult times. As is often the case, changing our language shifts our understanding and often brings us more into alignment with what we're trying to express, that we're turning inward by instinct or by design, just the way the seasons ask of us. It gives us the chance to destigmatize the abundance or absence of light and allows us to honor instead what we're experiencing. Our social expectations are for us to be happy and positive, and if we aren't feeling that way, the marketing is that there's something wrong with us. I have long resisted this commitment to toxic positivity 
and as a chaplain would have to soft sell or sometimes hard sell people into feeling however they were actually feeling without any apology. In wintering, May talks about challenging and sad times as times when our lives, like a field, might be fallow. Not a time of growth so much as a time of rest. We might feel empty, sad, lonely, rejected, sidelined, fragile, vulnerable, exposed. Often we may try to resist this, but the more we do, the worse it likely feels. Instead, May encourages us to lean into it, to sit with our feelings, to slow down, to be present, to withdraw from life, from the busyness clamoring at our doors for attention. In so doing, she has noticed in her own life the ways that she becomes more attuned to the natural world and therefore more appreciative of the gifts it offers. This then eases the feelings that she'd been experiencing, restoring her more to a sense of peace. I love the way that May integrates the natural world into her philosophy of coping with life's difficulties and our sadnesses. This reminds us that whatever we're going through will indeed pass, as well as the fact that it's all part of what is natural to experience. May's inclination when she's experiencing difficulties is to travel north. She lives in England and has traveled at times to Norway and Iceland, among other places. In the cold, she says, things seem clearer. So clear, she spends time talking about growing into a practice of swimming in frigid water and its benefits. No, thank you. Winter often catches us when we aren't ready. For May, the winter that preceded her book included her husband's appendix rupturing when he was waiting for surgery, her own abdominal pain eventually leading to a Crohn's disease diagnosis, and to complete their family trifecta, her young son refusing to go to school. There's no way to prepare ourselves for these things, and no reason to. Of all the possibilities that we might experience, we certainly can't plan for them all. Life happens. The particulars are unpredictable, but we can know that winter will come at some point. Nature prepares for the transitions of seasonal cycles, and although we cannot predict ours with the regularity or possible expectations for transitioning, we can do two things. Learn from past experiences about what works for us, and welcome the winter in as a time to get to know and care for ourselves better. These periods can be deeply painful for us, and I don't want to discount that fact. But we can remind ourselves that it is a season, like winter, and that it will not last. Winter is not the death of the life cycle, May writes, but it's crucible. She adds, it's a time for reflection and recuperation, for slow replenishment, for putting your house in order. We do often think of winter as a death in nature, the leaves fall, the birds migrate, the grass dies. These are indicators that life has changed into something else all around. But the something else is more hibernation than death, more resting than completely withering away. Things are happening, but we have to know where to look to see them. They're happening more slowly now, less obviously. An important lesson to remember is that, that nature teaches us that nothing grows all year round, or at the least, doesn't grow at the same pace. It comes in spurts and shifts. May writes, even as the leaves are falling, the buds of next year's crop are already in place, waiting to erupt again in spring. Most trees produce their buds in high summer, and the autumn leaf fall reveals them, neat and expectant, 
protected from the cold by thick scales. We rarely notice them because we think we're seeing the skeleton of a tree, a dead thing until the sun returns. But look closely and every single tree is in bud. Whatever we think of wintering, we can be reminded that our mere survival, not always a simple feat, is a sign of victory and that we are doing the most vital work we can do. And by framing the experience as wintering, we can talk about it in a way that encapsulates the whole experience rather than just one element of it, that light versus darkness. We can talk about feeling left out in the cold, about being lonely in the wilderness, about being barren or fallow in terms of excitement or joy, about our sadnesses. May shares from her family's experience wintering together. We traveled through the dark moments together. Yeah, I won't pretend it was fun, but it was necessary all the same. We raged Oops. and grieved together. We were overcome with fear. We worried and slept it off and didn't sleep and let our timetables turn upside down. We didn't so much as retreat from the world as let it recede from us. We howled out in pain to our friends and family and were surprised that so many rushed in to assist us sometimes with practical support, but sometimes just by sharing stories of their own. It helped. We felt broken into, place, into pieces, but at the same time, never so loved. Whether in your wintering you feel held by those you love or by the vastness of the universe, may you find those moments when you feel least lovable that there is yet a love holding you, and may its kindness and care help hold you through the next moment and the next until you are ready to emerge, rested, renewed, and strengthened in the spring. If you would please rise and join me in song for our closing hymn, number 346. Come sing a song with me in the gray hymnal.
I close every service with the same words from Jean Harrison Newyar, who has written in The Gift of Faith. In the lore of ancient China, there is a story of a philosopher who was asked, where is the road called hope? He replied, it does not exist, but as people move upon it, it comes into being. I invite you to continue moving forward on this road, this path, this journey called hope under a starry sky with me. We hope that you found meaning in today's service. We close with these words from Martha Lunson. We extinguish the chalice here that it might glow gently in our hearts. May it light your path as you leave this place. May it guide your way 